G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Ana Luisa a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, are you in the market for the perfect gift for yourself or for someone special? Then Ana Luisa has you covered. Ana Luisa provides beautiful, sustainable jewellery that not only looks terrific, but also comes with a great price tag. And for my listeners, I managed to pick up an even better deal with a discount of 10% on all products. Their jewellery starts at the affordable price of just $39 with no luxury markup, and I can attest to the quality of their product. I decided to get the missus a little something for our anniversary, the Anna Silver Necklace from the fine jewellery section, and man, is it a nice piece. The glossy texture and the delicate design are exactly what I was looking for, and the composition of the piece is perfect because it doesn't catch on clothes or hair, which is great for my wife because she now wears it every time that she goes out to business meetings or to just catch up with friends. The company also offsets 100% of their carbon emissions, starting with the sourcing of the raw materials all the way up to the disposal of their pieces. Their shipping is excellent and comes with custom taxes included for international customers, and with a 10% discount to boot, you can't go wrong. You can also check them out by following their Instagram or by subscribing to their newsletters, in which they always offer perks for engaged customers. So, go to analuisa.com forward slash scared, that's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com forward slash scared, treat yourself and your loved ones with a unique gift, and use my code scared to get 10% off. I absolutely recommend them, they're a great brand, making beautiful sustainable jewellery. Again, that's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com forward slash scared. You can also find a link in the description within tonight's episode. This happened when I was growing up around 2004 or 2005 when I was about 13 years old. It took place in a rural area a good ways outside of the town of Yulvade, Texas. The town itself was really small back then and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. But my father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about a, a thousand acres I think. It was down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought that he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. But not only did that help him with networking for his job, but it also gave us some quality father-son time, you know? Anyway, I remember the drive down there from Dallas was, well, pretty much torture. It was about seven hours in my dad's hardtop Jeep Wrangler. That car was so uncomfy and I just hated it. But all I had to do was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket. Something that I was actually never able to accomplish in my youth. The drive obviously took most of the day. So we got there in the early evening. The owner of my land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone lease it that year yet and the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life, I had been in scouts for a couple of years and spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends anyway. So needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. After unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land, we settled in. The cabin was pretty rough too. Dust and dirt everywhere, flies. I remember it looked like some raccoons had gotten in and they maybe done something to the floor. But after cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out, then setting up the cots that we decided to sleep on, something about that night was just weird. I never was able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but... I just had this feeling of being watched. Eventually though, I was finally able to drift off for what I guess was about an hour maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7 in the morning I think. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and it was horribly hot in the afternoon, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we 
came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs. Typical torn up ground where they'd been rooting around, so we followed them into the trees. I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees though. This was private land, so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there. Not to mention the gate was locked up when we first arrived. But the person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, Hey, we're hunters, this is private land. The person didn't move at all, dead still. We must have been about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. The weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and what looked like to be ski pants. Now, this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 outside by then. But my dad called out again, no reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnapped the clip to his pistol holster. That's all we had at the time since we were only scouting the area. The rifles were in the back of the cabin. We approached the person's right side and then my dad told me to stay about 20 yards away. I stayed, crouched down, watched him circle around to the front of the man, all the while talking to him asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man and... My dad stood straight up with a really confused look on his face. I called out and said, what's wrong? And he called back saying, it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring and as I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes that it was wearing were brand new. No dust, sap, bird droppings or signs of being outside for more than maybe a day at most. But at that moment, I looked at my dad and could see him getting worried. Almost immediately too after that, I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched and I knew my dad felt it too. I was pretty close to tears at this point. I remember feeling suddenly just really scared. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol he scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified, so it felt like an eternity, but it was probably only about 45 minutes max. But after returning, we packed up and we just left. We drove back home that day and we didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left, my dad called his buddy the owner of the land and he was just as confused as we were he said that he would go and check it out next week when he was in the area he also said that he had never had any issues with people because his property was high fenced my dad normally isn't a paranoid person mind you but me being young and the least possibly having someone there that we didn't know about he decides to be cautious and we just get out of there after we got back home, we talked a little bit, and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling, but didn't want to wake me up because he thought that I was sleeping too. Turns out, that next week, he got a call from his buddy, and he checked the whole property, and never found a trace of anyone, no mannequin or anything. This story, it still makes my hair stand on end, though. I have no idea what that was, but the paranoid man in me thinks that maybe it was some kind of a, a trap or something. It's definitely not the weirdest thing that I've ever encountered in the woods, but it's a top three for sure. And it's something that I guess will just remain a mystery. So my friend and I, we decided to drive from Philadelphia to Miami Beach. Unfortunately though, the car's block cracked in North Carolina. 
This was around 1975, although I could be off by 14 months or so, I guess. But I thought that it would be a bit of an adventure to sort of hitchhike the rest of the way. I remember waiting all night on a godforsaken stretch of highway in North Carolina. We got a 10 mile ride from some guy with a Prince Valiant haircut, who upon dropping us said, I'll probably see you guys in the morning on my way to work. Nine hours later, sure enough, he picked us up in a station wagon filled with vending machine sandwiches. We finally got to the area around the border with South Carolina, and that's when a guy, the spitting image of Bundy in retrospect, stopped and asked us where we were going. When I said Miami, he said, what street? We were overjoyed that this young guy, older than us, was going to take us straight to my mother's house in Bay Harbor. Now, I can't prove that this person was actually Ted Bundy, but what happened was creepy. And I've researched a little and found this happened at the time after Bundy's prison break in Colorado and at the same time that he was supposed to have moved into Florida. Anyway, after we got in the car, he offered us a, a joint. He didn't want to have any, but told us to toke up. Well, whatever was in that joint was powerful enough to almost paralyze both of us. He then began to start playing with the buttons on the radio, switching the stations compulsively almost every few seconds. And I began to feel paranoid because I could sense some weirdness exuding from this guy. Now, I was in the front seat and my friend was in the back. We went to a rest stop and he just disappeared into the bathroom for about an hour. Well, when he finally got back into the car, he said that he had to detour to his bank and he started to take us through miles of small roads in Georgia. I remember seeing houses on stilts in marshland, but he finally stopped in the most remote location where there was a single building that looked like a, an abandoned tavern, maybe? We were still stoned, and he got out of the car and went behind this building. I remember seeing palm trees, I think, and was so shocked that palm trees were so far north in Georgia. Anyway... He got back into the car and had these sunglasses on and I noticed that he seemed short as he walked back to the car. He said that he had to now speak with his lawyer and began to talk about real estate law and the changes in the law that would allow development in this area. And we drove for hours and hours until we got to Jacksonville. He pulled a car over on a strip mall like area and told us that there was a change of plans that we had to get out of here. We were exhausted and hung over from the angel dust or whatever was in that joint. We saw a bus station and took a bus the rest of the way to Miami. As I think back on this though, I am almost certain that this man was Ted Bundy. I still see his face and man, he looked a lot like him. And the time frame and the location were right too. We were two men so I don't think that we were in danger unless Bundy was considering killing men at some stage. I think that maybe he was just enjoying messing with us. I don't know, but that's what happened, and I'm pretty sure that I met Ted Bundy. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington near Mount Rainier, like... Not an official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. But one night, I wake up and hear something, open my tent, and there is a guy sitting by where my fire had been, right outside of my tent. But nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude just sitting there a couple of feet from my tent. No bag or pack or anything with him, just a guy. He saw me open my tent, his eyes got huge like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly, but over the next day I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well after writing it off as just some odd occurrence and a guy that was probably high or something and had somehow managed to set up a camp coincidentally not far from mine. Then, two days after that, and 10 or 15 miles away in a totally random direction that nobody could take the same path as on accident... I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises that I got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them and 
Out of the darkness, someone was like, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said, No. I don't even think that's really a place there. They kept talking from just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, but they yelled, Aim that away! And, kind of spooked and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person, I did. After like 15 minutes of me being very freaked out, and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer, so I shined my light that way again. And it was the same dude who had been outside my tent two nights before. Now, he had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days because there's just no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot as vast as that wilderness is. There's just no possible way. And as soon as my light hit him again, he took off. I started to chase him this time, but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness, in the dark too, so stopped quickly after probably only 100 or 200 feet. But this one definitely couldn't be written off. Because the only way that he could have been in both places is specifically if he was following me. I decided the trip was very over first thing in the morning at this point, and hiked back out over three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anyone following off my trail, and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me again. I really can't describe just how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods, and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid potentially being murdered. On the first night of hiking out, twice I had heard what sounded like a person walking circles outside of my tent, but by the time that I mustered the courage to look, nobody was there. On the second night, I could have sworn I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first in the distance, but slowly decided that it sounded more like a human making animal calls, but it could have actually been an animal. I didn't actually see the guy again at that stage. But it really sounded like a person making howling noises, and I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day, it's probably the most terrifying experience that I've ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were, and no way of getting an explanation, but I really can't articulate just what a terrifying few days it was. So this story is from my past and happened about 32 years ago in East Texas. My mom and dad divorced when I was 16 years old and my brothers and I lived with my mom. My dad visited us once in a while but not really on a consistent basis. He was a gambler, one of the reasons my parents split up in the first place, and tended not to come around when he was broke. But on the rare occasion that he won big, he would visit and spend money on us and then disappear again. My dad said that he had a job as a shuttle driver for a local hotel. He told my brothers and me that the shuttle driving was just a cover, that he actually worked for organized crime, which he claimed owned the hotel or something. He said that his real job was to drive out to various places in the area to pick up fugitives running from warrants, or otherwise wanted by law enforcement, bring them to the hotel to hide, and then later they would move on by means my dad said that he didn't know about. Now, my dad was always a blowhard and always exaggerating or out and out lying, so my brothers and I just sort of blew it off and didn't think much of the claim. Until something strange happened. My dad, he disappeared. It was 1988 and I was 22 years old and a college student still living at home. I worked as a full-time disc jockey on the overnight shift. 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. at a local radio station. My middle brother was 19 years old, lived in an apartment with a friend and worked at a nearby Dairy Queen. My youngest brother was nine and lived at home. Now one day, my brother called my mum and me and asked us if we knew where my dad was. And he says that some men apparently came to the Dairy Queen while he was at work and asked him if he'd seen my dad recently. My brother truthfully told them too that he hadn't seen or heard from my dad in months and that he just often does that, cuts off contact for months at a time. And my brother said that these men didn't say who they were but seemed satisfied and then left. 
I rather wondered if these men or anyone had called to talk to us and ask us where my dad was. But we also had not heard from my dad in months. The following day, my brother says the men returned to his work, and this time they flashed badges and claimed to be FBI agents. He says that they were very aggressive and demanded that my brother tell them where my dad was. My brother kept insisting, truthfully, that he didn't know where my dad was, that the last that he heard, he worked at a local hotel as a shuttle driver. But the experience definitely upset him, and he called my mum and me again. Upset, my mum called the hotel where my dad worked. The man that she spoke to said that my dad had disappeared weeks ago, and he had no idea where he went. The following day, my brother was at work when his roommate called and said that someone had apparently been in their apartment. The roommate claimed that when he got home from work, he found the sliding glass door open and the place was completely ransacked, but nothing appeared to be missing. My brother, very upset obviously, went to his apartment and found that, in fact, his address book was missing from the breakfast nook, and also a teddy bear that he recently bought for his son, and a photo of his son too were missing from his bedroom. Now, my brother and my mum and I were pretty much beside ourselves with anger and fear and paranoia, so we went to the local FBI office to complain that the FBI had done this, and to tell them, once and for all, my brother does not know where my dad is. Well, as you may have guessed, the FBI claimed no knowledge of the event and claimed that they were not looking for my dad. They also said that none of their agents had contacted my brother. Furthermore, when my mother told them my dad had claimed that he worked for organized crime, the FBI would neither confirm nor deny that the hotel had ties to organized crime or that there was an investigation going. My mum called the hotel again and told the manager that men were looking for my dad, that they were terrorizing my brother, and flat out asked the guy if there was any truth to my dad's claim to be working for organized crime. The man laughed and told her, Lady, there's no such thing as the mafia, okay? While we were trying to make sense of all of these weird details, we kept wondering why my brother was being harassed, but not my mother or me. And that was when I was reminded of a really weird event that happened to me about two or three weeks prior. But because I worked overnight, I was often wide awake in the middle of the night on my days off, with nothing to do. But one night, I went to the local cable TV company where my friend worked as a computer system operator, just to hang out with him for a few hours and BS a little bit. And at about 3.30 in the morning, I think... He had a big computer job to do, so it was pretty much time for me to go home, so I left. As soon as I pulled out from his company's driveway, though, a car was immediately behind me, sort of tailgating me. I mean, he was on me so quickly it scared the crap out of me, in fact. The car just seemed to appear out of nowhere. He also had his high beams on and was blinding me, and I couldn't make out anything about the car behind me. I couldn't see inside to see how many people were in the car, or what they looked like, or pretty much anything. I couldn't even see what kind of car it was, in fact. So I changed lanes to let the tailgater pass, but he changed lanes with me. I moved again, and he moved again. He was tailgating me and blinding me, and now seemed to be following me too. I stopped at the intersection, and... I got in the left turning lane with my signal on and he got behind me again. Since there was no other traffic at all anywhere around, when the light changed I zoomed across the intersection, streaked across all the lanes of the traffic into the far right lane and went through the intersection trying to lose him. And he followed me. Now though, it was absolutely clear that he was for sure following me. I cut into the nearby neighborhood and tried to lose him, but he kept following me anyway. I finally managed to zoom back out to the intersection, and I crossed over and went to the 7-Eleven at the corner, and jumped out and ran inside and yelled at the clerk that somebody was following me. As I did, I saw the car that was following me cut through the parking lot of the 7-Eleven, and for the first time, I finally got a good look at the car. It was a, a late model tan-colored four-door, and there were two white guys in it. 
The clerk just blew me off and said that I was exaggerating, that it was probably just kids messing with me and to let it go. I left, but I was very spooked by it and didn't want to go straight home for that reason. I was afraid that they might follow me and I didn't want them to know where I lived, so I just went back to my workplace. I knew that the disc jockey on the air that night would be my friend Paula, so I decided to go and visit her on the air for a little while and hang out and calm down. I told her what happened and hung out for about two hours. She also felt like it was probably just some punks being jerks or something, and that honestly calmed me down a bit. But when I got home, now over two hours since the car harassed me, that same car was now at my house. As I was coming down the street to my apartment and about to turn right, I saw the damn car pull out of my apartment, and as it passed me, these guys flashed their high beams on and off at me again. It definitely was them too. I panicked and I called Paula at the radio station and told her what happened. She was freaked too. She was like, oh my goodness, why would they wait for you at your home? Who is this? Call the police quickly. I was freaked out as to how they could possibly know where I lived in the first place, why they would wait for two hours for me, and then when they finally saw me, flash their lights at me and just leave. I mean, why would people do that? But now, remembering that event and putting it together with my brother's FBI visit and apartment break-in, it seemed obvious that all of this was tied together. I hadn't thought about it before, but now I remembered. My car was actually my dad's car. He gave it to me about two months earlier when he got a new one, so if someone had been looking for my dad, they might have thought that I was him, and when they saw me coming home, realized that I'm not him and then they just left. But who was messing with us and why? Where was my dad? Why are these strange people harassing us? My mum and my brother and I went to the local police station and we filed a missing persons report and a complaint too. We spoke to a very nice detective and about five days later we got a call from that detective because he had apparently solved the whole strange case. Turns out that my dad disappeared because he apparently owed his employers more than $50,000 in gambling debts. The detective confirmed that my dad did work for some unsavory characters, as he put it, but said that they weren't organized crime per se. He had no idea if my dad was shuttling fugitives or not, but he said that my dad was hiding out in Nevada somewhere and that he had spoken to him and he was alive and well, but in hiding. We asked though then, who the heck were those men and why were they bothering my brother like that? The detective explained that it's not that uncommon for unsavory bounty hunters and debt collectors to impersonate law enforcement and call and even harass people at times. My brother asked, how did they get into his apartment? The detective said that a sliding glass door is actually pretty easy to open and they probably stole the address book hoping that it had my dad's contact information in it. They stole the teddy bear and the pictures to use to scare my brother, which obviously worked. I asked the detective why the men only harassed my brother and not my mum and me. The detective then said, because my dad had apparently used my brother as a reference on his job application at the hotel, and gave my brother's address and phone number. The FBI agents probably figured that he was close to my dad and either maintained contact with him or, if threatened, would at least contact him. So, in the end, my dad eventually turned back up in town and acted like nothing had ever happened. He never actually spoke of the incident and we never brought it back up. I guess that he got the money that he owed back to them, but to be honest, I, I don't know for sure. But anyway, that's my story and... I hope you guys enjoy it. This happened on New Year's Eve day of 2019 to 2020. I was celebrating the end of another year at my house with three of my friends. My dad was out at a friend's party for New Year's and my younger sister was at a sleepover as well. Now, 
Uh, we were in the living room, just well, waiting for the cookies that we'd baked to be ready, eating the raw leftover cookie dough. We were watching Netflix, Castlevania Season 2 if anyone cared. But being teenage girls with no cooking skills for anything but pastries, we had ordered a, a ton of pizza and fast food from the local pizza shop. So when someone knocked at the door, we originally thought nothing of it. I mumbled a comment about delivery people not knowing what a doorbell was and got up pausing the TV and paid the delivery guy. I went back to my friends and we started to dig in, still watching the TV, and then this is the moment that I don't think that I could forget, even if I wanted to. The door to the living room was shut and the curtains were closed. TV at near full volume, we were all intently focused on the season's finale episode, either throwing comments out at the TV or just sounds of surprise. This began just as the final fight of the season started, when my best friend Ali had just shouted, he can turn into a wolf, at the same time that an aggressive bang came to the door, but but we didn't fully register it because of Ali shouting and the loud soundtrack. I paused the TV waiting a minute when another bang came to the door. I got up curious who it could be. I mean, no one should have been coming to the door at this point. I stuck my head out of the living room seeing a man just standing at the door. Because I'm a teenage girl, home with only two other teenagers, I obviously didn't answer but just stood by the doorway, able to watch him to make sure that he left. He didn't. He banged on the door rhythmically. My friends and me are different people. I'm very paranoid and organized, whereas they are more relaxed and they told me to sit back down and that he would leave. But then the door handle shook aggressively. Call the police, I said quickly. My phone was upstairs in my room charging, so Ali called triple nine. She was speaking with the operator when... Just everything seemed to slow down. The man had thrown a rock at the window in our door and the key was in the lock to get in and out and I'd have to go towards him if I wanted to stop it. The police told us to find a place to hide with a lock on it but there was no room with a lock. The bolt on the bathroom door had been broken since we had moved in but never had a reason to be fixed. So we ran out of the living room into the kitchen and I had two ideas. One get a knife in case I had to defend myself or at least just threaten him. Two, get out Storm. Storm was my dad's dog and he was a security and ex-police dog so I grabbed his lead, got him out of his dog cage and clipped on the lead grabbing a kitchen knife. I then went into the backyard with my friends. The man opened the door to the yard where we all stood and I desperately tried not to look scared but this man had to be about 40, long greasy blonde hair and blank blue eyes. They seemed to not give any emotion behind them but his mouth was in a sort of twisted grin and he was also holding some sort of a, a knife, maybe a hunter's knife or something. Storm was barking loudly at him but the man didn't falter. I was hesitant to let Storm off because well, I didn't want Storm to get hurt. I said to him, come closer and I'll let him off. But he just kept walking. I backed away, standing next to my friends. The second that I let Storm off, we get the knife, alright? I whispered, and my friends nodded. Ali still had the operator on the phone who said anything that we did could be classed as self-defense. So I ordered Storm to go and... Let him off the lead. Storm lunged at this guy, knocking him backwards, causing the knife to drop out, but not too far away. Storm had a tight grip on his arm though, so I ran over, kicking the knife away from him. This went on for maybe 10 or 20 minutes when the police finally came, and I got Storm off of him. And My dad was called and came straight home to make sure that we were okay, which we were, luckily. But my dad, he later found out that this guy was actually a convicted sex offender who had moved in two streets down and saw me walking Storm and our other dog too. All I can say is, man, am I so grateful that we have Storm and that my dad taught me how to deal with difficult and dangerous situations because I don't know what would have happened if we had just sat there watching TV.
This happened in the late 70s, as far as my dad can remember. It was around 78 or 79 when he was a teen out hunting in the woods with his friend. And this was a ways outside of Meridian, Texas, on a fall evening. So my father and his friend spent a lot of time messing around in the woods doing typical teen stuff. Firing off bottle rockets, hunting raccoons, underage drinking sometimes. But this day they were going hunting for squirrels, so when they set out, my dad grabbed his 22 rifle... It was just a Ruger or something, with a cheap scope on it. His friend had a really nice Weimarana that wasn't scared of anything. He would run up to bulls and chase them, he would get in scraps with bobcats, and he would chase off raccoons. He was walking along with them in the woods that day, and he said that there was an old creek bed that they would always go mess around in, so that's where they started. The walls of the creek bed were about five to six feet high, so they hopped down it and casually walked along, half-heartedly looking at the trees and such, when all of a sudden my dad said that the Weimarana started whimpering and wouldn't come any further. It hung back about ten feet from them, refusing to continue no matter what they said. A few seconds later he said that it just tucked its tail and ran off back into the direction of the house. This obviously made them confused, but they just shrugged it off. They took a couple of steps further, and he said that up ahead, about 60 yards, the creek took a hard right turn and elevated up on the banks were some trees. Now, the sun was setting behind the trees, and beyond those couple of trees was open field. So, you could see the sun setting relatively clearly where they were, and his friend stopped him and said, Hey, do you see that? And pointed in the direction of one of the trees. My dad said that he could see the outline of something big and seemingly hairy behind the tree peeking out at them. They weren't sure what it was at first, so they called out, Hey, we're just hunting. Are we cool? But there was no response or movement. And my dad thought that maybe it was some sort of a huge porcupine or something. Not totally uncommon in this area. So he held up his rifle and looked through the scope to try and figure out what it was. Since the sun was setting behind whatever it was, it was hard for him to see any detail due to the sunlight. But my dad told me that what he could see really freaked him out. He said that all that he could make out was a large black fur-covered head and shoulder sort of peeking out. As he was looking at it, what he described as a, a huge monkey-like hand grabbed the tree trunk. My dad froze, and my dad instantly froze, and his friend asked him what he saw. And my dad just shook his head and handed his buddy the rifle. His friend saw it too, and was freaked out equally. They sat there for a minute, just staring at it, both of them and whatever this creature was not moving. My dad has always said that he didn't know what came over him, maybe just his teenage hubris, but he suggested that they should go and check it out. Both he and his friend clambered up the left side of the embankment, and when they got to the top, the creature had ducked back behind the tree. They slowly approached and circled around the tree, my dad keeping the rifle handy. He always said, though, that he didn't know why, because... The small size of the caliber wouldn't have done much of anything against something that big. They both circled around the tree and it turned out that when they got there, there was nothing there. It was just gone. They didn't know where something that big could have run off to in that short of amount of time without them even seeing it. But nonetheless, they checked the area just to see if they could find any sign of what it was. And it turns out that they found two depressions where it would have been standing, but due to the four leaf litter, there wasn't any sort of definition to the tracks. He did say that whatever it was must have been really big and super heavy. The tracks were about 12 to 14 inches in length, but then he went on to say that they estimated the creature must have been about at least 8 feet tall. Other than the tracks, there was nothing else that could be found. No smell, no fur, no additional tracks, and 
Nothing in the tree itself. Just nothing. Afterwards, he said that they decided to just go back to the house and never really mentioned it to anyone or each other after that. My dad does love the paranormal, but he is a healthy skeptic when it comes to stuff like this. But that event, he says, made him become a huge believer in Bigfoot. And after having my own encounter, I've come to believe in something as well. I'm not saying that it's Bigfoot, but... I do think that something is out there that hasn't been explained yet. Growing up in the 90s, my mum was always very protective towards my sister and me. Most of the time it seemed to us like just overkill, like we were sheltered girls. But there was one incident from my childhood that makes me glad that my mum never dropped a guard, even one. So I was a preteen, probably 10 or 11 years old. My mum and I had finished doing some shopping at Sam's Club and we'd stopped at a Wendy's for an early dinner. To my eyes, nothing unusual had happened. We stood in line and ordered, we ate and then we left. We were walking in the parking lot and almost had made it back to the minivan when my mum said, sort of loudly, that she should probably go to the bathroom before driving home. I remember thinking that... That was a bit weird because, well, we weren't that far away. I was just old enough too that sometimes if my mum had to run into a store briefly, like less than five minutes, she would give me the keys and let me sit in the locked van and just read. The back windows were tinted so it was hard to see if someone was inside and she would always rush through her business and come jogging back to the van to minimise the time that she had left me alone. So I just asked her if I could have the keys and... She said no. She thought that I ought to try to use the bathroom too. I remember telling her that I didn't have to go. And through gritted teeth, she told me to try anyway. On our way back into the restaurant, we passed a middle-aged man. He was a bit dirty looking, as if he'd spent all day welding or working on cars perhaps. He was of an average height and thin and had longish grey hair. Nothing about him was remarkable to me, and he only made brief eye contact with us as we turned around. He was heading to a pickup truck parked in the front of the lot, while we were parked more towards the left side of the building. When we got back inside, my mum didn't head towards the bathroom though, but instead led us to a table where we sat down. Uh, mum, are we going to the bathroom? I asked. No, my mum said, but we're waiting here until that man leaves that one over there she was talking about the man that had walked behind us heading to the red pickup truck aside from the grime he didn't seem too weird to me so i thought that my mum was making a snap judgment why i asked i kept catching him staring at us in line she explained he would look at you and look away and look back and then he left right after we did it just didn't feel right okay and I'd rather be safe than sorry. I told her that I didn't see anything and asked if I could get a frosty while we waited. My mum was looking down into her wallet to see if she had the cash for my ice cream when that red pickup truck rolled by the front window, impossibly slow. The man in the driver's seat was turned so his shoulders were almost square with the restaurant as he passed, looking in. His eyes sought us out inside and found me. I will never forget the full bore of his eyes as he stared at me for the whole length of his passing the window before accelerating to normal speed and driving away. I'm 33 now and I still get chills when I think about that day. The man's stare and, in particular, the way my mum checked in mirrors for a red pickup truck the whole ride home. When I was a kid, probably 8 or 10 years old, I used to see shadow people in the night. It happened almost every single night, in fact. It was so frequent that I just sort of got used to them. They never scared me when I saw them. They just sort of walked against the wall and watched me while I was in bed. I remember that they never had clothes, just a figure of a body with a bald head. They used to open my door at night 
and I'm pretty sure that one even whispered my name into my ear one night before bed while I was brushing my teeth. I was in the washroom with my cousin and sister brushing our teeth before bed. They finished before me and I was alone upstairs. I could feel something behind me too, but didn't acknowledge it until I heard a really faint whisper of someone saying my name right into my ear. All I remember is freaking out and running downstairs screaming that someone just said my name. There was also this one time when I was playing hide and seek with three of my siblings and after finding two of them we were looking for my sister and toys started getting flung out of her room. Being kids we just sort of laughed it off, went running into the room looking for her but there wasn't anyone in there and we ended up finding her hiding in the basement. I also remember that I used to suffer from two different night terrors when we lived in that house. One of them I still can't explain to this day. I can only draw a picture, but it's hard for me to do because of how traumatizing it was. But the other was a dream of me walking down my basement and finding a little girl curled up in a ball in a box, crying. The strange thing about that second dream is that my younger brother had the exact same dream the whole time that we were there. I'm 23 now and he's 17 and... We both agree that there was some messed up stuff going on in that house, for sure. Four years ago, when I was 17, I'm also female, my best friend Hannah, also 17, came over to my house for the weekend. I believe that it was a Saturday night when it happened, but we stayed up late, made some junk food, watched some movies, etc., it was around 1am when I decided to take a shower and head to bed. After our horror movie marathon, I was pretty paranoid, so I asked Hannah to sit in the bathroom with me while I showered. So she did just that. She sat on the toilet and played some music on her cell phone, and we talked about whatever we had going on in our lives while I was showering. Finally, after about maybe 20 minutes of showering, I got out and I grabbed my towel. Hannah was still sitting on the toilet and she said my name, so I turned to face her. And that's when I noticed some movement in the bathroom window above her head. The window kind of distorted it slightly, but I immediately knew what I was looking at. It was a face, a man's face, smirking at me from the other side of the glass. The man immediately ducked out of view and I quickly faced away, wrapping my towel around me. I whispered to Hannah that there was a man looking in the window and she laughed, thinking that I was messing with her. So she bravely stands up and, to her horror, becomes face to face with this creep, staring and smirking at us. We run out of the bathroom and wake my parents, but the creepy dude is already gone by the time that my dad gets outside, and he better be glad for that. The next day, my parents investigate outside the window... And, sure enough, there was a cinder block underneath it that the man had been standing on, indicating that this probably wasn't the first time that he's peeped on me. And stuffed between the block and the wall was a bag of lotion. The window cling was pretty much useless too, as you could see everything inside the bathroom clearly from the outside, but we didn't know that at the time. And to this day too, I still can't shower without having the bathroom windows covered up. I've been doing my one hour of outdoor exercise at night because I find it most relaxing. My neighborhood is really quiet and I'm actually pretty lucky to live in a nice area which I've always considered super safe. I used to walk at night even before lockdown because I live right next to a canal so there's lots of nice paths that are super pretty at night when everything is all lit up by the moon. But anyway, I was walking last night and I decided to go to the shop first because I was hungry and then detour back to my usual route along the canal. When I was walking, I heard two guys speaking super loudly in German. I live in England, so it was a bit unusual, but not anything that I thought twice about. They looked around 30, pretty tall, and they had caps on, which I remember because they had matching designs, which I thought was pretty funny. They started getting really close, and when I glanced back to look at them, they started jeering, so I knew that they were looking at me, which kind of freaked me out so I sped walk towards the shop but had to stop at the road. 
I wasn't planning on getting hit by a car. They caught up to me though, but didn't stop for the lights to change, so walked across and went into the store that I was headed for. So I shrugged off my hunger and decided to just go for the canal for my walk. I stopped thinking about the men soon after though, just chalking it up to me being a generally anxious person. I don't particularly like walking past strangers at night, and I'm self-conscious enough as it is without them talking to or about me. But anyway, I complete my walk and I'm headed back home. For the story to make sense too, I sort of need to describe where I was stood. So on my right is the water itself. I'm stood on the path and to my left there's a big drop that goes straight onto the main road. Next to that road there's a row of houses and there's a railway bridge in front of me too. I have my earphones in and my music is pretty loud but I think that I hear someone shouting so... I take one earphone out and I listen, but it's pretty silent, apart from passing cars on the road below me. But that's when I see two men heading towards the bridge, and I immediately recognize them as the two guys who had jeered at me before from their caps. I stop walking as my anxiety floods back and consider phoning somebody because I irrationally think that if I'm on the phone when they walk past me that they won't bother me. But despite the fact that I've been stood frozen for ages... Nobody comes out from under the bridge. I wait, staring at the bridge for a while in complete confusion because there's no way they could have just vanished like that. I can see through to the other side of the bridge, so I knew that they didn't turn around and walk away or anything, but they certainly hadn't walked through because no one had passed me. After a few moments, I start to think that maybe I just hallucinated them or something. I have no history of hallucinations though, but I couldn't explain it any other way. So I start slowly walking towards the mouth of the bridge, and just as I'm about to step in, I see it. The shadow of one of the men cast across the wall. My blood literally ran cold as I realized what was going on. They were waiting for me at the other side of the bridge, but they must have been hiding behind something so I wouldn't see them. My mind went to a million different places panicking about what they would do if I walked under that bridge. I was convinced that they would just follow me. If I stayed where I was and phoned for help, I was certain that they would come out and see what was going on and I'd be trapped. So I did the only thing that I could think to do. I quietly ran to the fence that separated the canal path from the drop to the main road and climbed it. It was about thigh height, and on the other side there was a small space where the wall and the drop itself was. I waited for a couple of moments as the cars passed, but thankfully I live in a quiet area, so the road was soon empty. I managed to navigate myself so that I could lower myself off of the drop without A. making much noise, or B. hurting myself too much. At the moment that my feet hit the road, I raced to the side where the houses were, and sped walk down that path as fast as I could without making noise, only glancing back when I was nearing the end of the road. Men were still there next to the bridge. I could see that they were looking through the bridge to see where I'd gotten to, and quite honestly, I felt sick and terrified, but eventually I made it home safely. I don't know what they wanted. I don't know why they were there, and... I don't know who they were or if they'll be there again tonight, but what I do know is that I'm not going to be walking at night for a very long time. This happened to my buddy and me when I was at college during the winter of 2010. I was and still am an outdoorsy guy who has been at home in the woods for a very long time now. I've seen and heard a lot of things, but never had an experience like this, let me tell you. So I met my buddy at college that first semester, and we became fast friends. But before I knew it, he was inviting me back to his family's place that winter to stay there and do a bit of hog hunting. I've hunted hogs since I was old enough to hunt, so I jumped at the chance. We got to his parents' place, and man, was it beautiful. They own about 1,500 acres out in rural West Texas. His family raise, show, and sell cattle and are absolutely loaded. They're amazing people and they kind of took me in like a second son to be honest. 
Over my time at college, I was visiting them a lot. But since this family is avid hunters and the land that they live on is mainly for cattle, they own another 1,000 acres that they lease to hunters and also use themselves to hunt on. So, after a day or two at the primary ranch, we set out to the hunting lease. It was just my buddy and myself, no hunters had leased it that winter yet. We set our stuff up at the little hunting cabin that they had and we set our alarms to wake us up at 6 in the morning. We got some rest and we woke up ready to get out to the stand. Us being wild college kids, we brought the whiskey and the coke and our rifles. Spare me the lectures. We were stupid college kids, I know. We got to the stand though after a short hike through the cold and hopped up onto the stand. It was one of those big green metal stands that's elevated about 15 to 20 feet in the air. The area that it was set up facing was perfect, but to the left about 100 yards was mostly cliche rock clearing with trees lining it and dead cactus. In front of us was a wider clearing with sparse trees and various weeds and grass, and to the right was a decently dense patch of trees. Behind us was a dense patch of trees and a high fence about 30 yards back. We couldn't really see behind us though because the blind that he had was only 180 degrees view. Just a back wall and a door with a window that was boarded up because the glass or whatever it had was broken. And anyway, we just set up the chairs, started drinking and the waiting began. We had a beautiful view of the area and the sunrise coming from the east of where we were was just gorgeous. We didn't see anything for the first hour or so, I think, so we just kept drinking and chatting. I would guess about, uh, maybe about an after the sun had rose, we started hearing some limbs breaking and brush rustling from behind us. It sounded a good ways back, maybe 50 yards or more, so we rented our rifles hoping that what we were certain were hogs would circle around. I remember just sitting there waiting watching the fog from my breath for a good five minutes. The rustling got closer. Then I noticed a really metallic smell. The best way that I can describe it is almost the smell of rusty tools that they give off when you don't take care of them. They're kind of like a mix of copper, vomit, and uh, I guess poop. I looked at my bud and whispered, You smell that? And he nodded and shrugged his shoulders. A minute later, we're still waiting. The rustling seems to get closer. Then it just kind of stopped. After a couple of minutes, I could still smell this stink but no noise and figured maybe a couple of hogs had taken a dump near the stand and moved on. I reached to pick up the bottle as my buddy puts his rifle down and just as we're doing that, we hear a sort of scream or a grunt. Now, I have never heard anything like this. It was like a low grunt that escalated into a gravelly scream and it sounded like it was right outside the back of the blind. But before we could even really react, we heard a bunch of twigs and branches snap. It sounded like it was right outside the back of the blind. And not even a couple of seconds after, we feel the entire blind shake about three times as if a car had run into it or something. I dropped the bottle of whiskey and just looked at my friend and he looked just as freaked as I felt. But we heard a loud sort of singular grunt and then the sound of twigs and branches breaking again, slowly getting quieter. We just sat there, too freaked out to move for what felt like an hour, but it was probably about 10 minutes, I think. I don't know if it was the whiskey or just me trying to be brave, but I got up eventually and opened the door and... Nothing was there. We climbed down and we had our rifles at the ready. We both knew that it wasn't a hog, but tried to convince ourselves that maybe it was. We could see the old stand marks on the ground and the whole stand had rocked maybe about six inches. There was even a bent portion of one of the metal struts and two big depressions where it looked like feet had dug into the rocky ground. We figured that whatever it was must have stood there while it was rocking the stand. We stood there just looking dumbfounded and we decided at that point that it was high time to get out of there. 
We drove back to his main house and we told his dad. He said to just stay at their house with them for the night and we would go check it out tomorrow. When we got there the day after, we saw the same things that were there the day prior and his dad was super confused. I don't think that he initially believed us to be honest when we told him about what had happened. We found where whatever it was had come from. There was a clear path in the grass leading away from the stand where it had been depressed and you could see sort of tree limbs broken. But the highest one that was broken off was about seven feet off the ground I would say. We walked back 30 yards to the high fence that was there and sure enough about a four foot wide section had been mangled and bent down. His dad was really ticked off obviously but he was also really confused. He told us that he had never had this happen before and he reckons that it was just a giant hog but I never thought so. Now I don't want to say that it was Bigfoot but I've never had an explanation as to what could have caused that. Over the years I've grown to believe in Bigfoot more and more. My dad had an encounter with what he claims could have been Bigfoot as well so I don't know. Maybe it runs in the family? In any case anything that can mangle a fence like that and move a blind like six inches within the ground like that? It had to have been a heck of a strong creature. So this is going to be about all of the paranormal activities that have occurred in my house. I just really need somewhere to share all of this because I'm just going to go insane otherwise. So I'm 16 years old and I'm turning 17 in about two weeks. My family, me, my mum and my sister, used to live in a different house before our current one. My dad died about seven years ago and it was just us for about a year. Around some time in 2014 though, my mum met a man, his name was N, and he became my stepdad about a year later. He has four kids from his previous marriage. They're W, A, J, and E. Our previous house was getting too cramped, so we all decided to build a new house that could fit all of us. The house got finished right before New Year's going into 2017. The land that we built it on used to be a farm and is basically in the middle of nowhere. Back in 2017, we only had around two or three neighbors, but now we have like 20 plus. Now, this house has always just given me a bad vibe, but the paranormal activity didn't start until around the end of May last year. I had seen a lot of videos on YouTube, specifically Sam and Colby, of people doing seances with spirits, and needless to say, I was very intrigued. I wanted to try it myself. I didn't have a Ouija board, but I did have some candles, so at around midnight on my birthday, I went down to my basement, which is pitch dark, and I lit some candles. I arranged them in a pentagram style, and I started to talk. I was asking all of the cliche questions, like, is anyone there, and are there any spirits that would like to contact me? After about 10 minutes of silence, I started to get discouraged, and I just gave up. I went to go and blow out the first candle, but was interrupted by a scooter being dropped on the floor. The floors in my basement are stained concrete floors, so this made a really loud noise. I was instantly paralyzed in fear. I couldn't move for about a minute. After a while, I chalked it up to being a coincidence, blew out the first candle, and as soon as I blew it out, the same scooter picked itself up again and fell down again. At this point, my adrenaline kicked in and I booked it for the light switch. As soon as I turned on the lights, a wave of relief washed over me. I picked up the scooter and carried it to the garage, then went to blow out the rest of the candles, but when I got back to the candles, all of them were already blown out. Quite honestly too, I think this probably scared me the most because I know that I didn't blow those out and I remember them being lit right before I turned on the light, which means that the wind from me getting up and running definitely didn't blow them out, and the AC wasn't on at all as well, and 
It still bothers me to this day. I told my friends the next day. None of them believed me. Except for one. My friend Y. He dabbles in stuff like this too. He does tarot cards and does all sorts of paranormal stuff. He said too that the next time that he was at my house that he would do a ritual to find out what was in my house. And the next time something happened was on November the 2nd in 2019. This was the day a bunch of my buddies came over for a guy's night. Since my house was supposedly haunted, my friend, L brought a Ouija board too. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it to the guy's night to do the ritual. But that morning, when I was cleaning up in the basement, which is where the party was going to be, I heard a commotion from upstairs. I was home alone though, but... I didn't think too much of it, since my cats like to chase each other a lot, and I hadn't had any paranormal activity for a long time at this point. But when I got back upstairs, I noticed that one of my blankets from my room was now in the hallway. This actually scared me a bit, and as I approached my room with a kitchen knife, I noticed a sudden drop in temperature. The thermostat said it was 68 degrees Fahrenheit, but it honestly felt like it was about 30 I thought that somebody had broken in my window and I just left it open or something, but I was dead wrong. I turned the corner to find my door closed, which was odd since I never shut my door unless I'm sleeping. I opened my door though and it looks like just a bomb has gone off in it. Almost everything in the room is overturned and it looked as if somebody had broken in. My lamp was on the ground, my pillows and blankets were scattered randomly, my computer monitors were laying down on my desk. Thankfully, my bookshelf was tied to my wall, which most likely saved my TV in the end. I wasn't nearly as scared though until I noticed that my window was completely untouched and remained locked too. Then I noticed that none of my stuff was actually stolen, and there was a rotten stench that had not been there before. I searched the entire house for an intruder, but came up with nothing in the end. There was no way that someone could have broken into my house, because they just wouldn't have had enough time to get out without me finding them. The time between when I heard the noise and when I walked upstairs was only a mere 90 seconds. Nothing in the house had been stolen, and only my room had been wrecked. The smell soon disappeared before my parents got home, and they didn't believe me when I told them. My friends believed me because I showed them a picture I took with my phone. Later that night, after hours of playing around, we decided to play the Ouija board in the end too. I can't remember what time it was exactly, but I'm pretty sure it was around 3 in the morning. All of us, except for two of us, gathered around the Ouija board. Since there were so many of us as well, only around four of us could play at a time, and the rest had to just watch. While we were playing, a tennis ball got tossed at us in the direction of the two friends that weren't playing. We asked them to stop, but we were chilled by their answers. But one of them was actually asleep and got woken up when we asked him to stop, and the other was scrolling on his phone and literally had no idea what we were talking about. We eventually got into a conversation, though, with an active spirit that called himself QT. He said that he died in 2013 and knew one of us there. Everybody was confused though since nobody there knew anyone who had died in 2013. Well, except for me, my dad died in 2013. I remember that I read somewhere on the internet that after somebody dies, their spirit can become confused and can have sort of semi-amnesia. We started asking him more personal questions, but he kept on focusing on me. He said that he was my dad... This made me stop playing immediately, so we said goodbye to the board and we put it up. Now that basically just sort of killed the mood for the rest of the night too. Well, we all decided to go to sleep though, since one of our friends was sick and nobody felt like doing anything else. Everybody else fell asleep with ease, but that night I, I just couldn't sleep. I couldn't stop thinking about that spirit and if it actually was my dad trying to contact me. I realized that it was probably just a spirit that was feeding off my emotions. As I was dozing off, I hear a sound too that honestly made my stomach sink like a bag of bricks. It was the sound of a tennis ball being tossed at me. Each time it hit the floor, my stomach pulsed and it echoed in my ears. 
stairs. It slowly made its way towards me and came to a halt as it hit my leg. I was paralyzed in fear. Every part of me was telling me to get up and run out the door and run as far as I could, but I just couldn't. I could move my toes and fingers, but nothing else was budging. I forced myself to go to sleep in the end, which was difficult. I asked everyone in the morning, and my friend sleeping next to me said that he had heard it too, but he just thought it was one of my other friends pulling a prank on us. All of my other friends denied ever being awake and said that they didn't hear it. I can still hear the booms of that tennis ball hitting the ground to this day though, and ever since that day, little things have been happening that I just can't explain. So around five months later, we had another guy's night. Luckily, Wyatt was there to do the ritual this time. After a couple of hours of recording a guy's night EP, we decided to goof off until it was about three in the morning again. Most of our friends are not believers, and I completely understand their reasoning, and no shame on them at all. But when 3am rolled around, me, Wyatt, and a couple of my friends gathered around the Ouija board. I cut out a piece of paper that looked like, sort of like a doll I guess, while I poured salt around the board. He then said that there was one more ingredient, blood. We were all shocked when he started looking around for a knife too, and we tried to stop him, but he was just too quick. He grabbed a pencil and slightly cut his wrist. He squeezed out some blood onto the salt, then started to whisper some sort of a chant while putting his head down on the board. Me and my friends were really just frozen and sort of freaking out, but we'd never seen him do something like this, and nothing he ever did indicated that he was ever interested in this sort of thing. But he said that he had done this a million times apparently, and to relax. We ended up trusting his word and went along with this ritual, but we burned the paper doll and all had to say something that we'd keep secret our whole lives. Then we apparently contacted a spirit on the board. The spirit said that our ex-best friend, X, would be in danger and we would end up saving him. We all decided to take this to heart and let him back into our lives. This prediction has not come true yet, but it may have been a metaphor or something. Who knows? I can't really remember the rest of the night and all of the photos have been deleted off of my phone. It was only a half a year ago, but that's one of the only things that I remember from that night. Ever since that night, though... I've been having these really vivid dreams. I'm not talking about deja vu dreams, I'm talking about like real dreams. For example, I had a dream about an entire day, like a 24 hour dream. I woke up, followed my morning routine, went to school, had practice and went home. But when I woke up from my dream, I was a bit weirded out because the whole thing felt like it was real. But the worst part is that Everything played out exactly how it did in my dream, including every single conversation, pretty much word for word. I aced the assignment in math, I skipped notes in science and history, and I led the conversation in English, and that whole day went exactly how it did in the dream, but pretty much every single detail. It was weird because it was sort of like I was predicting the future or something. Every once in a while, something will happen that will shake me like radios going off in the night or unexplained footsteps. Lately, there's been a concerning amount of activity as well. The other day, the power went out at our house and I decided to play piano in our basement. I propped a flashlight up on the music stand towards the ceiling so it could illuminate the entire room. All was going well until the flashlight was completely tossed off of the stand. It must have been around five foot off into the air from the music stand before it started to fall as well. As soon as it hit the ground, the power turned back on. I realized what had just happened, and man, did I freak. I ran upstairs and told my sibling and parents, but nobody seemed to really believe me again. But whatever this thing is, it's starting to become more and more aggressive too. The past few nights too, I've been having the same real dream. In the dream, I'm playing piano in the basement. I'm playing one of my original songs until I hear a noise coming from the bathroom. It's crying. I can't tell who it is because the cry is never the same. The cry will be feminine in one moment though, and then in another it's a grown man. Then it's a child. I don't want it to hear me, so I slowly tiptoe to the bathroom. No 
On my way there, I stub my toe on the cabinet. As soon as I do, the crying abruptly stops. I make my way over to the bathroom and open the door, and when I do, a shadow figure emerges from the bathroom and wraps its shadowy arm around my throat, and I'm dragged into the bathroom with it. And as soon as I'm dragged into the bathroom, I am always jolted awake. To be honest too, I didn't think too much of it, until I found myself playing piano last night. So I was working on one of my original songs when that dream came to mind. I remember everything vividly and then I heard a horrifying sound. I heard that same crying coming from the bathroom. Adrenaline rushed through my body and my stomach sank as... I came to the realization that I was reliving my dream again. I got up and I grabbed the guitar that was right next to the piano. I knew it couldn't be my siblings because I could hear all of them walking upstairs. I made sure not to stub my toe like I did in my dream and I stopped in front of the door. It took all the strength in my body to wrap my hand around that handle. The crying continued to wail out through the basement until I turned that knob. It almost seemed as if the door handle was a switch or something too because the moment that I turned the handle, the crying stopped. I gathered all of the courage left in my body and I swung open that door. I clutched onto the guitar and prepared to swing at the figure when I realized that there was nothing in that bathroom. I quickly turned on the lights and I searched the bathroom, but it was empty. A wave of relief hit me once again and I just slumped over against the wall. I didn't have any energy left in my body and I was sweating like I just run a 5k marathon. I just sat there in that bathroom for about 10 minutes and then I got up and left. I came upstairs and found my siblings watching a movie that they had just started so I sat with them and I watched the movies because I just didn't want to be alone. I stayed with them until the movie was done and at that point I had gathered enough courage to be on my own. I said goodnight and eventually I went to bed. It was only 12 or 12.30 but to be honest I didn't care. I was exhausted and the entity or entities in this house are definitely becoming more active. My sister seems to think that this whole thing is in my mind playing tricks on me, but I don't know. I think that I know the truth. I don't know how my house is haunted since we built it ourselves, but it is. Maybe the land is cursed or something, or maybe it's the Ouija boards, but I don't really want to find out anymore. I'm about to be a senior in high school, and after I graduate, I'm going to try and get out of here as fast as I can. When all of this started, I was excited to have ghosts and spirits in my house. I mean, I was really curious and I wanted to know more and see more. But now, I just dread this house. It doesn't help too that I'm forced to be in this house at all times due to the quarantine at the moment. I just want away from this whole ordeal. So I had never heard of shadow people before and I had no idea what to call what I saw but one day I had the idea to type shadow hat man into a search engine and what I saw just shook me to my very core. I then read about countless encounters with the entity but none were like mine. All were it was night and I saw it in the hall or it was night and blah blah blah, but not me. What I saw happened in broad daylight and only a couple of feet in front of me. Here I am 17 years later and it still gives me the creeps. So like I said, I was 12 or 13. It was a Saturday morning and not a school day, so I slept in until 9.30.10. I woke up and had my breakfast with my mum and my dad they got into a huge fight. Then they went into their bedroom on the other side of the house to argue. I watched some cartoons and then around 11am I think I decided to go and brush my teeth. Now when you walk into my bathroom the sink is about two feet in right in front of the doorway. 
So I enter and I start brushing. There's also a big mirror, but I didn't initially see anything behind me in it. Then I finish brushing my teeth and I just get this sudden sinking feeling that somebody is standing behind me. But I knew that my parents were still arguing in their room and still saw nothing in the mirror. But I remember the fear I felt turning around. And then there it was, standing right outside the doorway, broad daylight, about two or three feet in front of me. And man, it was tall. It would have had to have crouched to enter the bathroom, in fact. It was completely dark and shadowy, except it had these horrifying sort of glowing red eyes. It stood there for a good second, just staring at me. I opened my mouth to scream, but no sound came out. I still have nightmares to this day of something bad happening and trying to scream, but no sound coming out. And then, it reached out its hand towards me, fingers pointing outward. Long, skinny, and dark fingers. You know, now that I think about it, it kind of reminds me of a Dementor from Harry Potter. Then, with its outstretched hand, it took a step towards me. Frozen in fear, I remember thinking, this is it. I think my life is about to be over. Then, after taking another step towards me with its outstretched hand, it just vanished. Gone right before my eyes. I immediately took that chance and ran and told my parents. They obviously didn't believe me and probably still don't to this day. My mum shrugged it off and my dad just laughed at me, which didn't surprise me. He'd be the dad in the horror movie going, nothing is wrong with this house, as pots and pans float midair around him in the kitchen and all crazy stuff happens. But after this, as long as I've lived in that house... I've always closed the door every time that I've entered that bathroom from then on, and I always slept with the light on for years, too. Anyway, I heard a, another story about a shadow person here some other time, and it, it inspired me to tell my own. To this day, I still wonder what the heck happened and what it wanted, but I guess that I'll probably never know. Years ago, when I was 11, I was staying home alone with only my little brother who was 7. At that time, it was about 9pm, dark and pouring rain, and we were reading in our room, right next to the front door with a big window and open blinds. That's when I hear the front doorbell ring, followed by knocking. I thought my parents had arrived. Strange, though, that they didn't use the garage or the keys like they always do. I looked outside to see their car, but nothing but rain. As I approach the door, I hear a man's voice that was definitely not my father's yell through the torrent. Hey, would you guys like some cookies? We're selling Girl Scout cookies. I'm shocked at this, considering the weather and the time of day. Saying nothing, I check the peephole and peer through the side window, only to see that it was definitely not my father with his girl as I expected. My heart dropped because standing there was just a, a fully grown man, maybe in his late 50s, and no box of cookies in sight, soaking on my doorstep. I can remember the gut-wrenching feeling of having to check the locks while he was right on the other side. For sure, he heard this too. The two locks were the only thing separating myself and brother from a potential monster. But he continued to knock and mention his cookies as I considered whether or not I should call the cops. That's when I remember too that the blinds, they were open in my room where my brother was with the light on. As I turn the corner into the doorway, I see the man carefully peering into our window, possibly eyeing my brother, distracted in his book. But my heart was pounding now as I began to panic and in a move that took all of my willpower, I quickly turned off the lights and ran over to the window to close the blinds in full view of the man. As fast as I could, I double-checked all the locks in the house, closed all the blinds, and told my brother to go and hang out in one of the big closets in the interior of the house. No windows. I didn't tell him what was going on so he wouldn't be frightened, and for some reason I never did call the cops or my parents. I just waited in the hallway until... Finally, he must have left. Still thinking about it gives me the shivers that so many things could have gone wrong that night. 
my worst fear since then is a stranger getting to the unlocked door before I do. This happened in Grindstone, Pennsylvania, back in the 90s. I was probably about eight years old, and my brother was about five-ish. We lived on a couple of acres in the country with a farm on one side, and your basic farm fencing with a thick forest on the other side. And with growing up in the sticks and dad being an avid hunter, us kids were taught to be aware of our surroundings and wild animals and things like that. Also, we were always taught not to just wander off without telling an adult, not to trust strangers as well, and the normal safety stuff that kids are taught. Anyways, as a kid, I always thought the woods were creepy or kind of scary. There was no way in heck as well that I was about to go off into them by myself. Way too many scary movies at this point. So, I was playing outside with my little brother one day, and he went into the house. And there I was by myself, and... I heard my mum calling for me. Kimberly, come here. Over here. Come on, Kimmy. This was a little weird to me because why would my mum be in the woods right now? I climbed over the fence anyways and started walking towards my mum's voice. Then out of the blue, I felt like I was being watched and got a really bad feeling. I started to wonder how mum got into the woods without going past me. You know, thoughts like that. So I turned and quickly ran back to the house where I found mum at the kitchen table and my brother playing video games in the living room. I then asked her if she called for me and she said no. She asked me why so I told her what happened. This led to us kids being told to stay inside and play for the rest of the day. I'm now in my early 30s and I've asked my mum many times about this incident and she always swears that she never did call for me that day. There's something about this situation, though, that really just bothers me. I don't know what it is, but for some reason, my skin always crawls when I think about it. So I was driving home late one night. There were virtually no cars on the road. Eventually, though, I noticed a cop car had zoomed up close behind me as if to pull me over. Only something was off. I couldn't tell how long it had actually been behind me because there was no siren and none of the lights were on. And not the little police laptop, not even the headlights even. In any event, realizing a cop was riding my tail, I pulled over. I was an 18 or 19 year old black kid who had just moved from the inner city, so my instinct was to comply. But looking back, I, I just definitely should have kept driving. Anyway... Sure enough, the patrol car pulled over behind me, but whoever was in the patrol car didn't get out, didn't turn on the lights or the siren either. The only illumination was a few of those sickly yellow halogen street lamps a block or so away, and with no passing cars, I couldn't actually see into the patrol car, so all I could see was a hardly discernible silhouette in the driver's seat. I sat there for a while. I don't really remember how long, but... It had to have been around five minutes, near total silence. I remember just being puzzled at first too. I think I even said, what the heck, under my breath a few times, but I just sat there, staring into the dark patrol car through my rear view. And then my brain began to turn over. There was just a, a creepy feeling that I was in danger all of a sudden, and it clicked that I was either being pranked or... I was about to be subject to something much worse. Finally, I calmly started my engine and pulled away. And the patrol car... It didn't follow. A year ago, I experienced something that still frightens me. But let me start at the beginning from a few years ago. At this time, I was a normal 15-year-old girl that lived with my family in a big old house in Switzerland. At this time, I started dating a girl there that lives in the same street like me, and soon we started to spend more and more time in my house together, until she moved finally, uh, about a year later. So my parents lived in the ground floor, me and my girlfriend and my sister lived in the middle floor, and the upper floor was empty. I never really felt uncomfortable in my house or anything, but after she moved in... 
That's when things started to change slowly. My girlfriend was a little bit paranoid, but I could understand that. Even after our house was renovated, it was still an old house made of wood, and old houses make some weird noises, right? You hear the wind howling through the attic, you hear the rain draining through the gutter, or you hear some crackling noises from the wooden beam starting to stretch when it gets warm, and she just didn't know noises like that because she lived in a very modern and quiet apartment. But sometimes she would shake me awake in the night because she heard footsteps or other noises. Most times from the floor above us with the empty guest rooms. I would always calm her down with, oh, that's just the house or the wooden beams crackling or our cats walking around or playing with each other. But that wasn't the only thing. You see, even after years she was just always scared of being alone at home like a, a little kid. I guess I could sort of understand that too. It's scary being alone in a big old house when you lived in a modern apartment. But years went by and I must admit that I started to get a little bit paranoid too. I mean, it's really weird to be home alone or to go to the upper floor alone when somebody says that the whole time there's somebody or something up there and I also started to hear sounds too. Not in the same direct way, but... I think I got paranoid, like, was that really a cat or just the wind in the attic? So I started to get slowly uncomfortable in my own house. To be fair though, I didn't think too much about it. Until one evening that honestly changed everything. So it was a really nice summer evening last year. My older brother and his wife organized a barbecue for the family on this evening. My parents decided to spend the night there with my brother, but we wanted to go back to our house, so we did. I drive home with my girlfriend, my sister and her boyfriend. It was really late, like 3am or something when we arrived. I drive in the forecourt of our house and my sister says something like, there's a light on in the upper floor. I say, maybe we forgot to turn the light off on our floor or something, but my girlfriend says that no, it's definitely the upper floor. We get out of the car and we look at our house and, indeed, we see the light on in the upper floor. The problem is that the light switch for the upper floor is in the upper floor, so none of us were up there and we can't turn on the light by accident or anything. I want to go in and I want to walk to the door, but my girlfriend quickly takes my hand and pulls me back really roughly she lifted her other arm up and points to the big window in the upper floor. And we were so scared that we couldn't move when we saw somebody standing in the window. He or she or, or whatever it was slowly walks to the window and looks directly to us. After a few seconds of just looking at this person with absolute fear all throughout my body, the light just goes out. Well, we jumped into the car in panic and drove away as fast as we could. All of us saw the exact same thing. Somebody or something was definitely standing in the upper floor and looking directly at us. And the only time that we went back to that house after this was to get our stuff out of there to go and visit my parents. We never did go up to that floor again or spend the night there again after that. And for that, I am very grateful. So I'm 18, female, and I'm from the UK. This happened in February of 2019. I was 17 at the time. I got set up on a semi-blind date. We had seen some photos of each other by a mutual friend, and his name was Cameron, and he was also 19. Cameron seemed like your typical average guy. Maybe a little into video games and anime and stuff, but overall nothing my friend told me about him seemed off in any way. My mutual friend gave us each other's numbers and we texted for a night and decided to meet in a Starbucks the next day since we were both free. I never liked to meet new people this soon, but I figured since Cameron knew my friend, it couldn't possibly go wrong. But boy, how mistaken I was. So I arrived slightly early, ordered my coffee since I never really like guys to feel that they have to buy for me, and parked up on a seat facing away from the door and pulled out my book. I'm uh, maybe there for uh, 15 minutes, just sort of chilling out, and I get a text saying that he's here. 
So I'm like, great, I'm at X table. I feel a presence over my shoulder and I turn my head slightly in acknowledgement. He must be here, I thought. But before I even get the chance to squeak out a hello, his lips latch onto my neck and he starts sucking on my neck. Now, I don't like people touching my neck at the best of times. I'm actually very ticklish there and I get super uncomfortable by people even touching my neck. The few times that I've had massages or hair treatments or whatnot, I've been holding in my discomfort. And he's now latched onto my neck like some sort of a leech. And this man smells just horrendous. Kind of like a dust personified or something. I freak out and elbow his chest to get him the heck off of me. He lets go and looks at me with this weird expression on his face and laughs in sort of deadpan. It's really, really creepy too, and I start to become alarmed. I ask him what the heck that was, and he just says, I thought it was cute. Cute in what world though, right? I uh, try to have some sort of a conversation with him. I'm like, okay, first impressions don't mean anything. Uh, let's try and give him a, a chance, I guess. But he's just creepily staring at my chest, and... He says, wow, I didn't know Asians could have boobs like those. I better not let you go. That was a direct quote too. You can't make this stuff up. I'm distinctly uncomfortable, but I don't want to just run away. He's giving me really weird vibes, so I just go into the ladies' bathroom and wait for somebody else to come in. I ask her to help me get out undetected. I don't want this man following me home or something. She of course agrees and she lends me her hat and scarf. It's February in the UK after all. And we come out of the bathroom together and she manages to help sneak out of the back door of the Starbucks without him noticing me. He asked my friend where I went but I told my friend to never mention me again. I was too terrified. I know that I probably didn't behave well. I should have just told him that I was leaving, that I'd had enough and I wasn't interested in him but... I was honestly just sort of scared. But a few people are asking about this friend, and the friend told me off for leaving without telling Cameron, saying that I was horrible and should have given him a chance. So I just ended up unfriending him too. Can't be having people like that in your life, right? And I also just want to let everyone know that yes, I'm actually okay. It's been over a year since I've even had a glimpse of Cameron, so thanks for anyone who may be concerned, but I'm doing okay. We all need a good Samaritan from here and there sometimes, so if you do see somebody in need, like I was that day, then please make sure to act like that lady and help a girl or even a guy perhaps out. It was around 6pm on a main road. It was winter time, so it was already dark out. I was just walking my dog and was listening to music. I'm a 22-year-old female with a tiny 20-pound dog. As I was walking, though, I saw a car parked down a small side road, out of the light cast by the street lamps. It was a silver minivan. All I could see was a shadow in the driver's seat. I kept walking, but I had my eye on this minivan because it was sort of in a weird spot. But the minivan eventually started to creep up on me, though, so I picked up my pace. The minivan eventually pulled over next to me and there was a man in the driver's seat. He asked me, Hey, excuse me, could you please help me with something? And at this, I just started to run away. I turned back and I saw that he had actually thrown his door open and started to run after me. When he got to the other side of the van, I could see that his pants were around his ankles and he was trying to run after me with his pants sort of down. He screams to me that he was going to kill me. I ran up to the nearest house and he pulled off. I left my dog at the door at the person's house and sprinted after this van. I wrote down the make, the model and the license plate on my phone and I immediately called the police. He actually ended up being caught and arrested 30 minutes later in a parking lot with his pants still down. And perhaps the creepiest part is that... He found several weapons and other tools in his car, like duct tape, zip ties, hammers, saws, you name it. It was in there. Yeah. 
Last night it was around 11.30pm and everyone in my house had gone to sleep already. Right now it's just me, my mum and my brother living in our house because my dad still has to go to work and he doesn't really want to risk exposing us to COVID-19. So he sleeps in our second home which is a few minutes away. I'm a 21 year old girl and I'm home from college so I'm staying in my childhood bedroom on the second floor. My window is directly above the part of my backyard where my dad keeps trash cans to collect rainwater. It hasn't rained in the last couple of days so the trash cans are empty. There are three trash cans directly under my window though. All the lights in my house were off except my bedside lamp. I was in my bed just texting some friends when I heard a faint screech directly outside of my window. I stopped what I was doing and immediately turned off my lamp. Then I listened again, trying to figure out if it was a cat or a child that I'd just heard. I didn't hear anything, so I just chalked it up to my imagination. But I was on edge as I'd never really heard a sound like that before. I kept my lamp off though as I don't have any curtains. I only have vertical shutters and light definitely bleeds through. A few more minutes pass... Then I hear another noise, but this time it sounds like a child's laughter. I froze because I've read stories about how people will try to lure unsuspecting victims by playing tapes of babies crying. But I never thought that it could happen to me, and I know that my immediate neighbours on both sides both have young children. And I wondered if one of them somehow got out of their house or something. But my window faces the neighbour to the right of my house, and our houses are relatively close together after all. I know that they have a toddler as well. They also have a giant pit bull who spends some nights outside in their backyard. There's maybe a 10 feet space between our houses and we share a fence as well. So I get out of bed and cautiously walk over to my window. First, I only open my shutter a sliver as I don't want to be seen if there's somebody outside. I can't see anything, but I heard the noise more clearly now. And... It's definitely a child's laughter. It sounds close. So I open my shutter completely, trying to see who's making the noise. By this time it's almost midnight, mind you, but I don't see anyone. But I keep hearing the laughter. I try to look into my neighbor's yard, but I, I don't see anything, and I don't think their dog is out. I'm pretty creeped out now, so I go back to my bed, and I just try to go to sleep. I must have laid on my bed for about five minutes when I hear a noise outside my window again. And I don't really know how to describe it, but the hairs on my arm and neck are standing up as I'm typing this. But first, I heard sort of a thud and then it sounded like someone was directly below my window moving the trash cans. I told myself that it was probably the neighbor's dog moving around, but I knew that it couldn't have been because whenever he's outside, he barks and plus... I didn't see him when I looked out my window. A few moments pass and I breathe a sigh of relief and relax a bit. Then I heard a clunk or a knock on my window and I got up again. I was so scared though that I couldn't move and I prayed that I just imagined those noises. But then I heard a louder clunk and I ran out of my room to my mum and told her what had happened. My mum turned on all the lights and came to my room and looked out my window but... We didn't see anyone. Then she double checked all the doors were locked and she told me to sleep with her that night. So I moved all of my blankets and pillows to my mum's room and I ended up sleeping there. Then today when I woke up I had already forgotten about the events of last night. I was in my room getting dressed. I was standing in front of my mirror and I saw something was being reflected on my carpet under my windowsill. I went down to investigate and I realized pretty quickly that it was glass. Admittedly, I had a few picture frames by my window and I thought one of them must have been knocked down when my mum and I looked out the window last night. So I look at each picture frame trying to see which one broke. I scan through the frames once and then I feel my heart drop. I scan through them again to make sure that I didn't miss any the first time. But all of my frames are intact and accounted for. So I slowly reach for my shutters and pull them open. More pieces of glass fall at my feet. And immediately, I feel sick because my window, it's partially broken. 
I scream and my mum comes and I show her my window. My mum asks me how this could have happened as my window wasn't broken when we looked out at last night. And there's nothing in my backyard that could have caused that. My room is on the side of my house and on the second floor and there are no trees on that side of my house at all. And no trees in my neighbor's side yard either. There are also no dead animals or blood which would have signaled an animal crashing into my window or something. We don't have a security system or any security cameras. Plus, my dad can't even stay the night with us at the moment. I uh, don't want to be afraid to sleep in my own room, but at this stage, I just don't want to be in there. So, I don't really want to give too much away about myself, but back in 06, let's just say that I was training with a special ops unit. At this time, I was completely mentally sound, extremely physically fit, and probably more adept in the wilderness than most of the experienced hikers detailed in these cases, not to mention armed to the teeth. Just a week before my final exam, we were running a drill of which I cannot tell you the specifics, but my duty was to stand at the perimeter on the backside of the assault in case the opposition tried to circle behind us. It was like the third time that we'd run this drill, and I knew that I was in hurry up and wait mode today. Bored out of my mind, I started scanning the tree lines. I noticed what I can only call a path as well. It wasn't a path in the traditional sense, but the trees on either side of it formed a straight line. And one of the things they taught us when learning to survive from an elevated vantage point was that nature doesn't build in straight lines. And to this day, I just cannot explain what came over me, but I laid my gun down and I just started walking. Walking turned to a jog, jog turned to a sprint... I can remember thinking that I really wanted to know where this thing led, and how many people before me had run down a straight path like this in nature. But during PT, I survived long distance runs on tracks by looking down at my feet, so out of habit I think, I looked down at my feet and I just sort of snapped out of it. I immediately thought, you know, what the heck am I doing, and I turned around and hightailed it back to my post. The path was less straight than I remembered and much further back to my post. I had no loss of time. I saw no scary woman beckoning me into the woods or anything and I felt no sense of great dread or something like that that I've heard before. But I returned to my post and the drill concluded. All of the drills were monitored with cameras at each of our positions so I actually had to answer for my actions. Honestly too, I, I thought that I was done for. They questioned me and I told them straight up that I just didn't know what came over me. Just a massive urge to follow that path and keep going. My superior simply told me to resist that urge should I ever feel it again and then sent me on my way. I graduated a week later and I never really thought anything of it. Now, here's the real kicker though. There was a troubled teen school nearby... We used to run into them all the time and they'd come out and watch our final physical test. I'd heard rumours from people though that it shut down in 2010 because a kid apparently went missing. They covered it up and filed bankruptcy after telling the kid's family that he committed suicide but they couldn't produce a body. And his last known location was my exact post during that day that I temporarily lost my senses. It was a long time ago before cell phones were prevalent and I was a female in my early 30s who had just driven our kids to the pediatrician. The Macon Guard doctor's office was an hour away from our home and I was just taking the two youngest of my three, then ages one and three years old, to our scheduled appointment. Because we lived so far away, their office always gave us the last appointment of the day and we were very grateful for it. The doctor had just built a new building off of a fresh spur of the highway, so the location was quite isolated in every direction, but a very nice facility compared to his old spot by the hospital there. His new building was also pretty far back on the new lot, and my car, a black Jeep Cherokee that we had owned for like two years, was one of only four or five cars in the parking lot when we got there. I parked near the front door, removed the kids from their car seats, and for the next hour or so we just waited, 
saw the doctor, we paid, and then we exited back outside. As I loaded the children in their car seats, the receptionist locked the glass doors, but when I tried to start the car, it just wouldn't turn over. Gathering the children again, I knocked on the door until someone followed us back in and asked to borrow the phone to call a nearby garage for service. I found one in the phone book, and the man said that he would come, but it might be a bit, so I told him my location, left to go back out to the car, rolled down all the windows, and loaded the children back into their seats as we just sat there and waited. Soon we watched as all the lights were turned down in the building again, and everybody left, leaving us alone in the parking lot. As it was still light, I spent a lot of that time trying to tend to the children, digging through our car for snacks and a bottle, making sure that they weren't getting too hot, etc. Although the service station attendant said that it was probably going to be quite a while, I was pleasantly surprised when a truck pulled into the empty parking lot pretty soon, and a man got out of his pickup, smiled and nodded to me, and said that he was going to raise the hood. He was uh, middle-aged, uh, a bit scruffy, but quite frankly, many gas station attendants sometimes look that way, especially at the end of the day. And I was just grateful when he began doing something under the hood almost immediately. I sat down again in the driver's seat with the door open, waiting for him to tell me to try the engine, but he seemed to be taking a long time, checking the connections and whatnot. And I longed for him to just grab jumper cables, but he just never did. Without getting out of the car, I asked him what he thought was wrong, and he said, Oh, uh, I think it's just loose wires, not the battery, and continued whatever he was doing. I couldn't really see his face at all from where I was sitting, but his hands were visible through that long horizontal slit between the windshield and the raised hood as we waited. More than once, he said that it was merely a loose wire, and if I would just come up really quick, he would show me which one it was, so it would never happen again. I remember kind of laughing it off though and saying that sadly there was no reason to show me anything as I didn't know anything about cars. I just thanked him and continued to stay in the driver's seat, again just waiting for the inevitable sign to try and start the ignition that was most surely coming any moment. At one point I remember distinctly thinking too that he was flirting with me but I was trying above all to be polite and kind as he was helping us out. We were hot and tired and sort of miserable, and truthfully, most of my attention was on the children, and so I was very distracted as well. Oddly enough, he was starting to sound a little frustrated with me because I wouldn't come up and look at the engine. I remember thinking that I really didn't want to make him so mad that he would just leave us there all alone, with the sun sinking so quickly. And then, the strangest thing happened. Another truck suddenly pulled in that desolate parking lot, and as it did, this nice guy working underneath my hood suddenly slammed it shut, ran to his truck, started it, and drove away really quickly, without even saying a word of goodbye or anything. Needless to say, I was both confused and a little bit anxious when he did this, because I didn't know who was now arriving. I even remember feeling a little bit frightened that he suddenly left me there alone with two little ones, defenseless. Why wouldn't he at least stay and speak to whoever was parking next to me now? It certainly seemed the southerly gentleman thing to do, at least. I looked around and was very aware once again that there was no visible cars on the road, no homes or businesses were nearby, and the sun was continuing to set quickly. As this new pickup pulled up next to me, I got out of the car once again, apprehensively this time. Upon exiting, though, he immediately introduced himself and his name and his voice seemed to match who I had spoken to on the phone much earlier. He then actually called me by name, apologized for being so late, and finally smiled and stared towards the road, asking who that man was that had just left so suddenly. Relieved and unfazed, I just laughed and told him, Well, I don't know. I thought all this time that he was you. And we both just laughed as he then grabbed jumper cables, walked to the front of my car, raised the hood and started to hook up the battery terminals quickly. I immediately sat back in the driver's seat once more, suddenly grateful that, with luck, that air conditioner would be blowing full blast shortly and once again checking on the children. While listening for the familiar words try it, I had my back turned towards the children when he surprised me by suddenly walking to the driver's side door. 
And in the strangest voice, he said, Um, ma'am, is this yours? And when I looked into his hands, he was holding a, a long, thin, dagger-like device that was about a foot and a half in length. It appeared to be very old and covered with reddish dust, yet one end of it had tiny small finger holes, as if it was a mix of a, a long, thin sword and scissors combined. I remember being amazed, but not immediately frightened, and I asked where he found it. Uh, it was under the hood, he replied. I said, just matter-of-factly, that I had never seen them before. But how weird was it that those things had somehow been stuck and undiscovered in my car for all those years? I remember thinking that it was rather funny, shaking my head and even smiling a bit. But he continued to stare at me unbelievingly and he looked oddly pale too like he couldn't find the words to speak for a bit just staring at this bizarrely long thin sword like object still within his hands honestly though i didn't care one bit about it all i could think of was getting the car going letting me pay him and the cost obviously and then just leaving he didn't say anything else after that just quickly set them on the curb, started his truck, and then signaled for me to start the jeep. And when it immediately caught, my three-year-old cheered. Grateful, I quickly turned on the air conditioner full blast, rolled up all the windows, aimed the air vents back towards the back seat, and reached for my purse to pay out. I stood up and took a few steps to meet him so I could hear the amount now owed. But with both our vehicles running, he came back around to my driver's side and Instead of handing me the bill, he irritated me a bit by walking right past me and picking up that weird object once more. Hey ma'am, he said, sort of slowly. I want you to look at this just one more time, and held them out for closer inspection. This time, I moved a bit closer, and I actually really looked at it. In his hands, even though he was a really big guy, the item appeared incredibly long and thin, it almost had a, a bayonet-looking quality, except for the strangely small two loops on one end. As he held it, he spoke quietly and slowly to me, trying desperately to make me understand something that apparently was still going over my head. Ma'am, these weren't hidden somewhere in the engine. They hadn't been there very long at all, in fact, because they were sitting right on top. They must have just been put there, in fact. I shook my head no and smiled, as I said but they're obviously very old and rusty. To which he pointed more closely and replied, Yeah, but see how sharp they are? These look like they've just been sharpened, in fact. And when I looked down, he was right. I don't know why I hadn't noticed it before. The length was certainly long and dagger-like, but the sharpness was undeniably the most frightening quality. As I paid him, his final words to me were, Ma'am, I don't know what was about to happen here, but I'm sure glad that I pulled up when I did. He quietly thanked me when taking the payment, told me that I needed to call the police whenever I got home safely, and then asked me where I wanted the item. I didn't want to touch it, so I released the back window and he placed it inside. We both then left the lot together, him turning one way, me turning the other towards the small highway that would lead home, still an hour away. I did indeed contact the police the moment that we arrived home, and I got the children inside safely. But although they listened politely, they declined when I offered to bring the scissor-like thing to them. The officer that I spoke to said that they sounded as if they were specialized surgical shears from my description and measurements on the phone, which... I must admit that I found quite disturbing, as you can imagine. I had actually tried to be really careful not to touch any of the surfaces, hoping that they might be able to do fingerprints or test the surface for blood or something, but they just really didn't seem interested. The officer simply told me that it sounded as if I was very lucky, and that I might want to keep the shears for a few days, just in case someone from his office got back with me later. But that was pretty much it. I wrapped them carefully in newspaper and then I placed them in the brick storage unit behind our house and they remained there for several more years, untouched, until we finally moved away and threw them in the trash. But here's the creepy part. 
So around that time, if you were to look through the newspapers, women were going missing in Georgia, some never to be found as well. And of course, all these years later, it's still happening. I have often wondered too what would have happened if the service station attendant didn't arrive when he did. If my children would still have a mother. If I would still have my son and my daughter. If I would have missed all these years with them. I guess that I may never know but I did learn something about myself that day. I always felt that I was pretty aware of my surroundings. Pretty good at reading circumstances and staying safe. But because I was exhausted and tired and hot and stranded in a different city, my common sense and my intelligence just simply left me for a bit and just wasn't working at the time. And many of my friends and my family still think that it could have cost us our lives that day.